or just simply come up and ask. Uh, you know, one of the things that um, I've been thinking about this week are, you know, there are things that we believe when we were kids that uh, now we look back on and go, yeah, that was a little silly, wasn't it? Am I the only one that was there? Like, like what did you believe? And if you're a kid in here, I'm going to spoil it for you. I'm sorry, but what did you believe when you were a kid if you got a new pair of shoes? What did you believe? Run faster, right? I'm glad. I'm, please tell me I'm not the only one who thought that, right? Man, you had your you know, brand n- nice new. I can run faster. I can jump higher. I, you can't, but you thought that, right? Or, um, or do, does anybody ever tell you when you were a kid that if you swallowed your gum, how long would it stay in your stomach? Seven years, right? I don't know who came up with that lie, but that is a flat-out lie. It's not true. Some of you are looking at your mom and dad like, dude, what's up, right? Um, uh, it, I can remember uh, my parents saying coffee's going to stunt your growth. Uh, no, coffee just, coffee just keeps you up all night. That's what it was. It wasn't about your growth. They just wanted you to go to sleep. Um, the, the, my favorite is the, the family pet went to live on the farm. Um, did anyone ever tell their kids that? Come on, be honest. It's okay. Shh, okay. Sorry, Emma. Um, <laughs> the farm is the hole in the backyard. No. Um, <laughs> Emma, like, do you need a hug, baby? I'll give you a hug in the middle of service, okay? Uh, no. Uh, and one of my favorites was you make some kind of a funky face, and what would your parents say? Your face is going to stick that way, right? And some of y'all say that like this week, okay? And it's okay, right? And, and you know, even the fact that, um, that I can remember thinking that all adults always told the truth all the time. And that's really dangerous in my family because my family loves to joke around and mess with people. And so they would tell me things and I would do things because you're an adult, you're older, you always tell the truth. And I can remember discovering wait a minute, they don't either, they're not lying, they just don't know what they're talking about sometimes, right? And so there's those things that we believe, those things that, that we assume to be true that may not always be true. And I want to spend some time this morning, and we're talking about who we are in Christ, who we are as Christians. And, and for years, there was a statement that I believed, and I believed it to be true. And, and quite honestly, until relatively recently, I would have agreed with this statement I'm about to tell you. And, and let me just set it up, because some of you are going to freak out and think I'm doing heresy, but just, just stay with me for the whole time here, because this is a statement that the minute I say it, many of you are going to go, amen, that's me, I, I I, I agree with that. I believe that. I know that. Um, you, you, some of you have heard this your whole life. Um, and it's not that the people that told you, just like the people that told me, were not bad people who were trying to, you know, manipulate or hurt me or teach me something that wasn't true. It was just what had been taught. And, and when you understand why, I mean, and you can understand why, and, and yet at the same time, not only is it not true, I think it has a, a profound f- effect on the way that we see ourselves and the way that we live. And the statement is simply this. It's the belief that I am a sinner who's saved by grace. It sounds really good. It sounds even spiritual. And some of you are going to go, wait a minute, Stephen, where are you going? Because I believe that about myself. Like, I am a sinner saved by grace. And I, and I understand why we believe this statement, right? Because because guess what? And this is not going to be news to most of you. Maybe some of you, we're all sin. We all sin, right? Like some of you go, yeah, about 15 minutes ago, okay? I sinned, okay? And we, and we know that we all sin. And we all know that, or at least most of us know that not only do we sin, but, but that we can't really fix our ourselves, that we're, that, that, that we're never going to stop sinning this side of heaven, that we struggle, that we have those things about us that we don't want other people to know. And, and so we know we're sinners and we know we can't fix ourselves. And we know that our only hope is God's grace, right? That God's going to do something for me in spite of me, that God's going to save me. Then we know that it's Jesus sending Jesus to pay and to, to die and to pay for our sins and to rise again three days later. So we understand where this idea that I'm a sinner saved by grace comes from. But let me, let me challenge us to think about this statement a little bit. Let me challenge you to think about what the, what the noun or the object of that statement is. And that's that I am a what? A, a sinner. That that's, that's my identity. That's who I am. That, uh, that, that, and, and as a result for many of us, we feel, we think, we believe that that's all we can be. I'm a sinner. And therefore, I do what? 
What do sinners do? They, they sin. So I'm a sinner, so I sin. And, and that's sort of like all you can expect from me. It's all I expect from myself. It's the, it's the best that I can ever be is someone who, who sins. But I have a hope, right? I'm, I sin and I'm a sinner, but, but at least I know that because I'm a Christian, I, Jesus died for me and paid for my sins, so at least I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. But right now, the, the best, the most that I can hope for is to be someone who just sins now, and, and one day it's all going to be better when I die and I get to go to heaven. And while this sounds good and deep and humble and theological, what it does is it sets us up to to live a very destructive life. And here's why I say that, because I, and, and you may have thought this or seen this, uh, I, I sat and looked and talked and been around so many people who are allowing sin to destroy their lives, and, and whether it's addiction or immorality or some unethical behavior or, or gossip or keep going on, fill in the blanks, whatever it is, and, and we allow sin to just sort of take over and control and destroy our lives, and, and if someone confronts them or someone says something or someone challenges them, what, what is our what is the response that we that we tend to have it's like hey don't judge me i'm just a sinner saved by grace but what if that's not the way god sees you what if god says i've got so much more for you than being a sinner saved by grace what if god says i've actually called you to be a saint now that word is a big word isn't it in fact, when I say the word saint, I would doubt that if I ask you, hey, raise your hand if you're a saint, I, I bet most of us probably would not put our hands up initially. There might be a little peer, peer pressure because we're in church and all that stuff, but, but I bet most of us don't think of ourselves as saints. Like, I mean, a saint, they're, 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 those are the people that wrote the Bible, right? They're the saints, St. Saint Paul and St. Peter and St. John and those guys. Or, or maybe it's those people that have done, like, really amazing things who, you know, sacrificed their lives and died for their faith or did something really special for God and God's kingdom. And, and those are saints, but I'm not a saint. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But I want to challenge you this morning that God saved you to be a saint. That God sent His Son to live a sinless life and to die on the cross so that you can be a saint. And in fact, it's not prideful to call ourselves that because that's what God's Word calls us. And in fact, it's not humble to think of myself as a sinner saved by grace. It, it, in fact, it does the opposite of that. It says that, hey, it's all about me rather than about what God is doing and has done in me and through me and even in spite of me. You see, what we forget so often is that Jesus changed everything about us. Now, let, me, let, me, let me be clear this morning that every one of us struggles with sin. Every one of us sins, and every one of us sins regularly. In fact, I've, I've told every service, and um, I've got three children. One's like that tall, and one's like that tall, and one's like that tall. And if you want to look around, if you want to know what my sins are, go ahead and ask them, and they'll be happy to rat me out. Uh, they'll tell you everything I do wrong when I get upset when I shouldn't and the, the, just the struggles that I have. They'll be happy to tell you that their dad is not perfect. But not too bad, right, Emma? Uh, she's like, what? Uh, anyway, I shouldn't pick on my daughter in church. So listen, every one of us sins. 1 John 1.8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You and I have sin. All of us do. In fact, you don't just have sin. You were born a sinner. Did anyone ever have to like have a sit down with their parents and their parents say, hey, let me, let me tell you how to start sinning, okay? You're, getting, you're a little behind on the sin curve, so let's sit down, let's start, let me, let me tell you how to, how to sin, let's, let me tell you how to sin well. Like, I want to just, I want to tell you how to sin. Did anyone ever have to have anyone tell you how to sin? You know what? The moment you started walking, you started going places you weren't supposed to go, didn't you? The moment you started talking, you started saying things that you shouldn't say, didn't you? 
And some of you have just continued to grow on past that, right? Keep on going. Because no one, sin is natural. Sin is easy. Sin is something that we all do. And the Bible says that not only do we sin, we were born sinners. And we were born sinners because of what Adam did. In Romans 5, 19, it says, For as by one man, he's talking about Adam, disobedience, the many were made sinners. You and I were made sinners because of what Adam did. But that's not where it ends. Listen, so by the one man's obedience, many will be what? Made righteous. Not earn righteousness. Not become righteous. Not, not achieve it. Be good enough to where now you can say I'm righteous. No, he says that because of what Jesus did, you were made righteous. You were born sinners. And that's why we need Jesus. Because Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And as I say often... I get credit for what Jesus did. His righteousness is my righteousness. His holiness is my holiness. His sainthood is my sainthood. And so in Christ, I am no longer just a sinner in Christ. I have been made righteous. I have been made a saint. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's what? He is a new creation. The old has gone, has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Listen, Jesus doesn't just make you a better person. He doesn't just fix a few of your problems like an old car where, you know, let's get a new paint job and maybe fix the engine up. No, Jesus makes you new. He makes you what you were supposed to be. And he turns us from a sinner and to a saint. And so in Christ, I'm no longer a sinner saved by grace. That's what I was. In Christ, I am a saint who sometimes sins. And there's a profound difference in that, isn't there? There's a profound difference in the way that we see ourselves and the lives that we live because I realize now that no longer does sin control me, no longer do I have to just sin because that's all I am. No, I realize that I am a saint, that I have been set free, and God has so much more for me than just a life controlled by sin. And if you don't believe me, listen, I, I challenge you. I challenge you to find one time in the Bible where it calls a Christian, a child of God, a sinner. It may say you sin, like John says that, right? you sin, but it doesn't say you are a sinner. In fact, over 240 times in the New Testament alone, you and I are called saints, we are called holy, and we are called righteous because of what Jesus did in us. I love the way Paul opens most of his letters like, like, go back this afternoon and look, and in Romans he says, all in Rome who were loved by God and called to be saints. In 2 Corinthians, the church of God at Corinth with all the saints. In Ephesians, to all the saints who are in Ephesus. In Philippians, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. In Colossians, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ. To me, one of the craziest ones is how he starts out the book of the letter to the, the first letter to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at what he says. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. And our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth. Listen, to those sanctified in Christ, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Here's what's crazy about this to me, is that if there was ever a messed up church in the Bible, Corinth was it. It really was. If you read 1 Corinthians and all the things that Paul says to that church, that was a poster child for how not to be a good church. Like, if you want to know how to be a good church, do everything that they're doing in Corinth and look at everything they're doing and do the opposite of it. 
They had leaders in that church that were abusive and were taking advantage of people and were in it for only what was in it for them and didn't care about the people. They had added all these rules to the things that Jesus had said and they ignored all the things that Jesus said and sort of created their own pseudo-religion that was all about them and, and they, were, they were disunified they, or everybody was doing what was good for them and they didn't care about each other. They weren't willing to do what's best for each other, only what's for themselves. They, uh, they, they had a leader who was having an inappropriate relationship with his stepmom and everyone said, ah, what's the big deal? Who cares? This was a messed up church. And if there was ever a church for Paul to say, all right, to the church in Corinth and all you losers and sinners who are messed up and broken, but thank God he saved you, this was the church. But he didn't say that about them, did he? He said to the saints. In fact, he, he even tells us why they're, they're saints. He says, you have been called, right? He, he says to those who have been called. Think uh, that, that phrase there describes like when a king would have a banquet and he would send out messengers to all the people that he wanted to invite to the banquet and they would have the invitations to the party, to the banquet and they say, hey, the king has what he has called you to come to his banquet. And you didn't say no to the king because the king calls, you better go. Um, and there were consequences for not going, right? And the king would say, I've called you to the banquet. I want you at my banquet. And then when you get there, you would have a, a, a there would be this big room with all these tables in it. And at one of the tables would be a little place card with your name in it. And that's your spot. It's not just that he called you. He has a, he has a specific place for you to be there. He wants you there. And what Paul is saying is that God has called you. He wants you to be in his family you want to talk about overwhelming that's overwhelming to me isn't it that the creator of the universe says i want you he's called you and really our only response is although he lets us respond however we want but our response is what to call upon him it's to answer the 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 invitation with a with a response and it's to, again it would be the messenger comes the king wants you at his banquet and you would call upon the king and say yes my answer is yes i will be there i want to be part of the banquet and he's saying to us those who have been called and call upon the Lord. Man, that is the simplest picture of what salvation is, isn't it? We're living our life where we are sinners. And he says, but I call you. And all we have to do is say, yes, I want to be part of the family. And what happens? We become sanctified. That's not a word we use every day. But it's a word that means to take something that's ordinary or even profane, and to make it holy. It was used often to describe the, 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 the furniture, the things that were in the temple. So in the, in the room that they had called the holy room, which was, which was between that and the holy of holies, where the presence of God was, they had some lampstands. And these lampstands were, were, were to be lit year, all, year, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day, um, the whole year, right? And... Uh, and, and they, would, they would be lit and, you know, representing the presence of God, the light of the Lord. And, and, uh, and, and yet when they were first made, they were made just by ordinary people. And they would have a time of blessing over these lampstands. They would wash them and cleanse them. They would make them worthy of being used in worship of God. And he says to us, the, the image that they would have had is, wait a minute, I'm living my life. God calls me, I say yes, and he makes me holy. He turns me from a sinner into a saint. He sanctifies us. What an amazing picture that is of who we are. And so when we look in the mirror, we, we can choose how we see ourselves. 
we can choose to say, you know what, all I am is a sinner. That's all I'm going to be. I don't have any control over it. There's nothing I can do about it. Or we can choose to say, I see myself the way God sees me. And He sees me as a saint. Now, if you're sitting here today and you go, Stephen, I don't feel like a saint. I understand, I get it, but you have to decide, am I going to live my life based upon what I feel or am I going to live my life based upon what Jesus says about me? What am I going to live on? How am I going to view myself? And I want to encourage you this morning to realize that Jesus died on the cross to save you and to make you into a saint, that you are set apart. You're set apart. And because you're set apart, let me, let me challenge you to think about two things, that because you're set apart, focus on freedom and not sin management. The goal for our lives is not to sin less. The goal of our lives is not to make sure we don't sin on the big sins, but that we can do the little sins because that's not that big of a deal. The goal of our lives is not to just be a little bit of a better person or to hide our sins from everyone else or at least to say I'm not as bad as another person. No, the goal that God has for us is for us to live in freedom. And sin robs you of freedom. The point that God has when he tells us not to sin is not because he's, he's mean and he wants to keep us from having fun. No, God tells us not to sin because sin robs us of freedom. I think about some of the, the messages of our world. Sleep with whoever you want, whenever you want, however you want. And God says you can do that. But it robs you of true intimacy and companionship. I think about our world that says take any substance you want as much as you want because you can do what you want to do. And, and God says, but wouldn't you rather deal with the hurt and the brokenness that you're just trying to cover up with that? I think of our world that says gossip and slander and talk about and tear people down. And God says, I'd rather you have friendships and relationships and trust and unity i think about our world that says you do whatever feels right to you and god says all that's gonna do is put you back into bondage you see god sent his son to die to pay for our sins to set us free and why in the world would we ever go back and live in bondage again? Why would we believe the lie that bondage and sin is better than the freedom that we have in Jesus? I mean, honestly, name something that's better than Jesus. I mean, it may feel better in the moment. It may not ruin our lives the first, second, third, fourth, or however many times you want. But when are we ever going to, let's just be honest that there is nothing that we do. There's nothing that we feel. There's nothing we can experience that's better than Jesus. And we need to look sin in the, uh, in the face and say, you know what? I want to live in freedom. I'm not going to let sin keep me from God's best and that's the that's the ugly part of sin is that it presents itself as better than Jesus and it always puts us in bondage and we say sure I'll go back to that sure I'll live in that sure I'll ignore Jesus sure that's going to be better than him and then one day we look up and we realize we've ruined the freedom that God offers us. Because we choose bondage over freedom. So live for freedom. Second thing is, this is going to sound funny, but clean your room. And that's not just for the kids, and that's not physically your room. Although some of you might need to clean your room, I don't know. Uh, if you ever need to feel good about yourself, there's a television show I, I want to encourage. If you're having like a bad day, bad week, and you're not like, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling like maybe, I don't know if my life matters or if I got anything good going on, watch an episode of Hoarders. All right, have you any of y'all ever seen that, that TV show? It is a, it is a, 
it's a sad show. I don't mean to laugh at other people. I know there's real issues and real challenges, and I don't get it, but these are, these are, this is a show where usually someone is a hoarder, like, like, like not just they got a bunch of stuff. I mean, I'm talking about you cannot even walk through their house. There's just, it's just filth and disgust and things that just every, I can't watch it after I've eaten. I got to have like the, it's like swimming. You got to have 45 minutes between, okay? Because it's just like, it is, it is disturbing on so many levels. And what happens in horror is people that hoard and they usually have a family member who calls into the show and says, look, we need help. My family, my mom, my dad, whoever it is, they need help. They're, they're living in this, in this horrible conditions. Will you come help? And they show up and, and it's a television shows, I don't know how much they care about the people. They at least act like they care about them. It makes good TV, and they get counseling for them, and they get encouraged when they have an intervention, and they, you know, do all, and then they come to this point where they, they put out these big tarps out in the yard, right? And they, they say, okay, this stuff is just trash. We're just going to throw it away, and this is stuff to give away. This is stuff to sell, and, and this is stuff that you can keep, and they're trying to sort of get you to limit the amount you can keep, and they get all these people to come and start cleaning, and, and, and and, and as they do that, what amazes me every time is it's not, that, it's not that people have a hard time letting go of the stuff they should sell or give away. It's the, just the, the filth, the junk that people go, I can't let go of that. I, it's disgusting, I know, but I can't let go of that. It's, it's, it's nasty, but, I, but, but, it's, but it's all I know. It's all I have. If I let go of it, what, what might happen? And you can see this just, you see that, that pull inside of them. If I don't know if I can let go of that. And it's easy for me to sit there and be judgmental. But here's the truth is that many of us, myself included, tend to be sin hoarders. There are things that we know are destructive and hurtful and they're hurting ourselves, they're hurting our family, they're hurting our kids, they're hurting our loved ones, but we can't let go of it. Can't let go because it's all we know, it's all we have. And what might life be if I don't have that any longer? And maybe we need to realize and, and come to a place where we say, you know, whatever it takes, I'm going to clean this, this junk up. Junk attracts junk, and sin attracts sin. And every now and then, what if, we, what if we were really honest with ourselves about our sin? What if we got someone to come and look at our lives and help us deal with our stuff? What if we were willing to go to the extreme not to fix someone else's problem. I'm talking about our own issue. What if we were willing to say, you know what? I'm going to be honest and I'm going to deal with this and I want to, God, clean my life up. I had a, a young man when, when I was serving in Connecticut that I was discipling and sort of spending some time with. And one day he comes to me and goes, Stephen, you know anybody who needs a, a nice phone and a nice computer and I go me but no not really I go yeah I'm sure I got, I got some people who could use that and because I'm just giving mine away and I go why are you giving yours away and he goes well I, I have an addiction problem that I need to deal with and uh, as long as I have my my smartphone as long as I have my computer um, I, I, I it just it's right there and I, I, I need to deal with it and I want to and so I'm going to get rid of these things and all of his friends thought he was nuts. Because like, how, how can you possibly survive without a smartphone and without a computer? I mean, how, how in the world are we going to live our lives without that? And they thought, I mean, they were saying things like that too. And go, look, just, just put filters on. Just do what you need to do. And he's like, no, listen, you can get around those, everything. There. I know what I need to do, and I'm getting rid of those things. So he had a flip phone i know some of y'all in here charlie you got your little flip phone with no pig but like and we made fun of him for his flip phone and if he needed to use a computer outside of work he went to the public library and used the library computer and i told him i know your friends think you're crazy i know people around you think you're crazy but i want you to know you are my hero because you do not want to let sin control your life and you're willing to do whatever it takes and that 22 year old young man was more of a man than, some, than this 40-year-old because he says, I will do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever it takes to get rid of the junk in my life that's keeping me from God's best. 
Not because I'm embarrassed, not because I care what other people think, not because I need to somehow earn my way to God. God knows who I am. I'm, I am a saint whether I want to be or not in His eyes. No, but because I don't want to live in the bondage of sin, that sin controls. And I wonder if sometimes we need to just clean up our lives for a moment and take it serious so that we can see who we really are, so that we can experience the freedom that we can have in and through Jesus. You know, I was, um, this was a, this was an interesting concept when, when God began to teach this to me. Because again, I know my sin that I struggle with. I sure don't want it, I, I joke, I sure would hate for it to show up on the screen behind me, make sure there's nothing up there, you know, I don't, I don't want to do that, Right? There are things about me I don't want anyone to know. There are things about me that I get so frustrated with myself about. And, and sometimes it's hard for me to see myself for who I really am. But the truth is that, that I am, whether I acknowledge it or not, whether I understand it or not, that I am a saint who sometimes sins, not because of me, but because of who Jesus is and what he has done in me. And so, I do not elevate, and, and listen, I, I hope if you remember nothing else, you remember this, that you and I do not elevate Christ by pretending what He did on the cross does not, did not make you holy. You elevate Christ by saying what He did on the cross was enough to turn this sinner into a saint. That's what He did for you. So here's my challenge. Here's my challenge for you this morning. Live like a saint, like the saint that Christ died to make you. You can. You don't, sin doesn't have to control you. Yeah, you'll sin and get up and keep going. Yeah, your room's going to get messy again. Clean it up and get going. Yes, you're going to have struggles, but deal with them and move on. You are called, created, designed to be a saint, to represent, to take Jesus to this world. So live like the saint that Jesus died on the cross to make you. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for all that you've done. I thank you that you are a God.